This morning we are talking about a living miracle. Living miracle. I got this straight from the Holy Ghost, which is most all of our sermons. But this one I was a little like, okay, Lord, we're, we're going to talk about this. This is what you got. Uh, I want you to help me and shout through it. But a lot of it's going to be some teaching too. I mean, ever heard of the term self awareness? Self awareness is a big thing in the corporate world, and. Uh, they make it feel like, oh, we just care about you, so we want you to be self-aware. But it ain't it. They realize in the corporate world, we can't do much with people unless they have a little self-awareness. Uh, the opposite of self-awareness is someone who is self-unaware. What does that mean? They, they don't know how they come off to the people around them. So it's really hard to use somebody like that because... Uh, they're not able to function well with other people. They don't, they don't get along good with other people, right? So they're just unaware. Some people have these blind spots. So uh, we're going to touch on this a little bit from the Spirit of God. I believe the Lord wants to uh, move in us and show us some things. So y'all stay expecting and excited. There's such an electricity in the air. What is self-awareness? How aware are you of the way you are perceived by those around you? That's the definition of self-awareness. Now we all have some blind spots. We all think, you know, we just got it all together. <laughs> But what we don't realize is there are some blind spots, and we're going to be talking by the Holy Spirit about some of them blind spots today. But it's kind of like, I thought of this example. Have you ever uh, seen yourself on video and you thought, oh my gosh, I do not look like that. It is adding 20 pounds, I just know it. <laughs> it might not be adding 20 pounds, maybe you just... <laughs> Maybe you just added 20 pounds, you know. I do not sound like that. There's no way. My God, listen, I had to edit my videos for such a long time, and I'm like, oh, my God, I can't stand the sound of my voice. Who feels that way? Because you don't see yourself the way other people see you, and you don't hear yourself the way other people hear you. Just In, in your head, you can't hear your voice like people around you hear you. So it's just, it's a common thing, and that's just a natural example of some of what self-awareness is. Do I really look like that? Do I really sound like that? Let's look at a scripture this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul said it like this, you are our epistle written in our hearts. Known and read by all men. Verse 3, clearly you are an epistle of Christ. He's talking to believers, y'all. You are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. Isn't that a beautiful scripture? We are God's living epistle. In other words, we're His letter to the world around us. But as beautiful as that is, it also means everyone around you is trying to read you. What is your letter telling to the people around you? How's that letter spelling out to everybody else around you? Are you really a living epistle? And this morning, this message is called A Living Miracle because that's the theme for this year and that God wants our lives to be that living miracle, that testimony to everyone around us. That's where he's trying to get us to, right? Jesus said, my father is blessed when you bear much fruit. The Father wants you to bear much fruit. Not only much fruit, but more and more, more excellent fruit. And part of this is kind of working on some of them blind spots in our life. Living epistle means you are a living, breathing, 
walking letter of God's goodness, glory, and grace. That sounds so good, right? It sounds so good just to look at it like that. But when I have to apply my life to it, then I have to start saying, okay, how are, pe- how are the people around me reading the letter that I'm writing in my own personal life? Today, God wants to get down into some good, godly self-awareness. Why? Because what's real matters. What's true, it really matters. Growth, real growth, really matters. Real maturity in the Lord really matters. It really matters. God is not after stroking our spiritual ego. And that's what a lot of us want. We want God just to be, tell me how much you love me and how okay you are with who I really am. Don't tell me I need to deal with anything. If I don't want to go to that kind of church. Why don't you preach an uplifting message? Because maybe your letter stinks to everybody around you. Maybe instead of a living epistle, you are a dead epistle to everybody around you. And if that's what Christian is, being real matters. If I had a bowl of fruit up here, you know, have you ever been a Hobby Lobby, all that fake fruit? It looks so real, right? It looks so real. And if I had a bowl of that fruit and I had some real oranges and some fake oranges, and I wanted to offer you one, and you got one of the fake ones, and you bit into that thing. Well, you don't bite into orange. You try to peel it, and it ain't nothing but styrofoam. Would you be disappointed? Because it real matters. If you really need an orange, a fake orange ain't going to do nothing for you. Being real matters. The letter of our life to the world around us matters as believers. Real fruit matters. Producing real fruit matters. Maturing in the Lord matters. Sean, let's come back and talk about miracles a little bit more. Let's release the miracles. This is about miracles. This is about being a living miracle. Amen? And I believe the Lord's going to open this up more and more. I have a little bit of an illustration. Just give me the first mirror, honey, and I'll have you give me the, you'll be my Vanna White today. So, so, you know, it's a lot like self-awareness is a lot like mirrors. And uh, if you're like me, your barber, who has a barber in here, every time he finishes, he hands me the mirror and hand me the other mirror. I didn't think I needed this soon. He hands me the mirror and he has me look, he rolls around my chair and look at the back side of my head. Oh, man, that's a good cut. And a lot of times I'll have my glasses on, and he hands me the mirror, and I don't want to slow the process down. So I'm like, man, that's great. It looks just like it does every time. That's awesome. <laughs> but the point is, is you cannot see some of the back side. It's a blind spot. Have you ever looked at the back side of your head and thought, man, my head looks funny? But everybody else knows what your head looks like, and it don't look funny to them. But for us, what is it? It's a blind spot. And sometimes we live and exist in this mirror where it's, oh, man, I'm a radical Christian. I love God. Man, this is just happening right here. It just looks so good spiritually. I'm full of faith. Until we we get a mirror that's like, oh, no, I didn't even know that was there. That's a little bit of a blind spot. Man, my head looked funny. It's got a bunch of dips in it. What's up with that? That's where my brother hit me when I was four or five years. I don't know. I was vaguely vaguely abused as a child. We'll talk about it later. Not that brother. (laughs) Scott is the good brother. Scotty's almost my best friend, but other than that. (laughs) But 
Self-awareness is a lot like this. It's a lot like those blind spots. If you're a football fan in here, who likes the instant replay? Man, you, can, you, you just know his foot was in. But then they show you that other angle, and you're like, it was out. Sure enough, it was out. And it, the picture doesn't lie. And this is what blind spots is like. It's like God taking the angle, and the Word of God's going to take an angle. Let's go in 2 Timothy 3. Help us, Lord. We got just a few minutes. 2 Timothy 3, verse 10. Never preached out of this scripture before, but the Lord just showed me all kinds of stuff this week. But you, Timothy, certainly know what I teach and how I live. Talk about a living epistle this morning, a living letter. And what my purpose in life is. You know my faith, my patience, my love, and my endurance. We're going to see this morning, it is no mistake that these two sentences are together. These two sentences in this scripture are not two different concepts. They are concepts that's helping explain the other. You know what I teach. You know how I live. You know what my purpose in life is. In other words, Timothy, you have been reading the letter of my life for a long time now. You've been looking at this. You've been looking at my letter, and you know it. You know what I believe. You know how I live based on how I believe. And you even know, because of those two things, what my purpose is. What you teach in this scripture, because you might say, well, that doesn't apply to me. I'm, I'm not a teacher. I'm not Paul. I'm not teaching things. Yes, you are. We just read a scripture that says your life is a letter to the people around you. So if, if that bothers you saying what I teach, let's, let's change that. This is more about what my creed is. Let's bring it a little bit farther down. This is, this is what I believe. Because your life is teaching what you really believe, whether you like it or not. Nobody knows this better than our children. Ah, they got to see it match up, y'all. They got to see what you teach be the same thing that you live like. But really what I teach is, it's really what I believe. So Paul says, you've read my life. You know what I believe. And then he said, how I live, this is your conduct. This is your behavior. This is uh, your default mode because what you believe will always determine your behavior. If you have behavior issues, you need to go back to what do you really believe? Sometimes this is why we found religion, but we didn't find that relationship with Jesus and we haven't seen behavior change yet because what you believe has not crossed over into how you live, how you conduct your life, how you have your behavior. I sit in that chair because I believe that chair will hold me up. We conduct our lives a certain way, not because of religious belief, but because I have a relationship and my relationship with God forms my belief and that forms my behavior. And those two things, how I believe and how I live is determining the purpose in my life. And this isn't the message we're getting somewhere else. And we've got a short time to get there. So let's listen good. There's no reason to, to try to figure out all of our purpose. You see, we get so confused with purpose. Why, why am I here on the earth? What is my purpose? I can give your purpose in three points, every single one of us. What we're all really longing for when we're saying that is not purpose. We're talking about specific direction, and that's a whole other topic. Lord, what's my direction? That's a good prayer. Purpose, I'll say this, if you stop trying to find the direction and get in the flow of God's purpose, you'll intersect the specific direction God has for you. 
We just want to know the thing before we get in the main thing. That's a selfish part of our nature. So what is purpose? What is purpose? Purpose is, number one, worship. I will never get past this. Every single one of us are worshipers. We were created with an innate design that we are going to worship something, someone. But my primary purpose in life as a believer is to worship God. Oh, does that mean I got to sing songs all day long like Tabitha? Is that what? Huh? Put on worship music and just all day? No. Worship, worship is honor. I honor God. This is the first part. I get into this flow of purpose. I honor God with everything that I do. I'm not saying nobody in here is perfect with this. This is why we talk about blind spots today. With the way I work, I'm honor God. With the way I treat my family, I'm honoring God. I'm worshiping God by, by how I live, by how I do. My whole life is worship to Him. Do you all understand? This is honoring God with everything that I am. And then the second part of that is, uh, as a purpose, as my purpose, every one of us has these same three purposes. I'm called to a family. My purpose is a family. Oh, I'm blinding people. All right. My purpose is to belong to a family. Not just a physical family, but a spiritual family. I don't just belong to myself. I belong to the people God's placed in my life as well. Amen? That's part of my purpose. I can't neglect that part of my purpose because I'm missing a huge part of who I am. A huge part of who I am. God has, God has made me as a, as a dad, a husband, a father, spiritual father to some people. That's, that's my part of my purpose. But what is your purpose? Honor God and honor the people he's put in my life. Lastly, uh, giving. I'm going to find the specific direction if I get busy at worshiping God, honoring the people in my life. And lastly, what are the gifts he's given me? Every single one of us have get, has gifts that he's given us. And my purpose is to use those gifts to be a blessing to the people around me. You get busy about your purpose, you're going to find the specific direction that God has for your life. But Paul said, you've been reading my mail. You've been reading my life. You know how I live. You know what I believe, and you know what my purpose is. But he goes on, throw that scripture up again first in 2 Timothy 3. He goes on to talk in that scripture you know my faith, my per patience, my love, and my endurance. This is really where we get the second mirrors out. This is really where we start taking a look at brass tacks. No, what is real about this? Because I could just say, you know my faith. You know when I stand up in front of the church and what I look like on the front surface. You know. How are you doing today? I'm blessed. How do you look on Monday morning? <laughs> that's, the, that's the deeper question about some godly self-awareness. So Paul says, what you believe is really what he's talking about is your faith walk. What you believe is how you're walking in faith. It's not how you look when you say, this is my faith. And and what you are living is really your love walk. Oh, God, help us. And with those two things, we're honoring God in each of these areas. And this is what God says is going to produce much fruit. And it's going to be the living letter that the world reads in our life. It's not a mistake that these are mentioned in this order. Because faith is demonstrated by patience. Who in here has ever just said, I'm in faith, I believe it, I receive it, and it just happened like the next second? I know there's some suddenlies, but more often than not, we're walking things out. 
And the strength of my faith is demonstrated in my patience. Oh, Lord, Pastor Ryan, why are you talking about that? Let's, let's look at the backside of your head again. <laughs> because I can tell you on the front side how much faith I have. I can even quote a lot of scripture about that. I mean, you could think I am the most spiritual, but when it's just me and nobody else, what's on the backside of that thing? You know how you know? Your patience. Patience will tell you how good and how strong, really, because does, if it's real, does that, does that still matter? It's not how I look starting out. Everybody can look cute at the beginning of the race. Everybody's uniform looks just as good, does it not? It's what it looks like when I cross the finish line. Hebrews 6 verse 12 says, We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through what? Faith and patience inherit what has been promised. So there, obviously, this scripture says there's a tendency to be lazy. You got to not just read the scripture, you got to read it. There must be a tendency that I can get lazy with this thing. But it says through faith and what? Patience, interesting word, inherit. Well, normally, you don't have to do anything to inherit the promise. To inherit. What did you do to get your inheritance? Somebody had to die. <laughs> right? But it's a little bit different in the kingdom of God. Somebody already died. And what we have to do is lay hold of the promises of God. And we can't get lazy about it. What happens if we get lazy? Well, there will be no inheritance. No, 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 no. God's saying as your coach today, don't get lazy through faith and through patience. Inherit the promises because the fruit matters. The miracles matter. Real matters. God maturing you matters. And this is a part of that maturity process. Not how spiritual I look on the surface, but when you scratch the surface, what does my patience look like? Okay, let's talk about the next one. Love is demonstrated by your endurance. So he said, you know my faith, you know my patience. Then he said, you know my love, my endurance. This isn't a mistake. In fact, in the Amplified, in that love chapter we love so much, it says, love endures long. How many married folks we got in the house this morning? <laughs> not me, though, honey. It, not me. It's just as easy as pa. <laughs> but real love, so patience is things you're waiting for. Endurance is things you're persisting through. They're two different things. I'm patiently waiting for some promises. I'm patiently waiting for some miracles. But endurance is not waiting. It's persisting through. <sighs> There are some challenges. I'm going to love no matter what. I'm going to love no matter how hard it gets. And the strength of my love walk, don't forget, this is the letter we're telling the world. This is where it comes down to the real deal. Not just, oh, I love you. I'll be praying for you. It's when it gets challenging. In churches... Uh, one fa faithful statement, and I agree with this, we don't know how submitted we are until our will is challenged. That's when we really see the real person come out of the box. <laughs> oh, that's where you've been hidden. We all, can be, we all can be submitted as long as you're doing what I want you to do. But don't you tell me I can't do what I want to do. Well, this isn't submission. This is just you agreeing as long as you agree. Submission is not known until your will is challenged. But the strength of love is demonstrated 
by how we endure. Do I really love you? Am I persisting through the challenges? Am I persisting? Am I not giving up? And here's the word of the Lord to us today. Do not give up if you don't see the miracle on the first day. Do not give up if by June you're still believing God for the miracle. Do not let go. You're going to persist through. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is where we're not just declaring miracles. We are a living miracle. How do we look when we hadn't seen it yet? We're going to persist through. Paul said, you've read my letter. You know what I teach. You know how I live. You know what my purpose in life is. And you know it because you've seen my walk of faith by patience. You've seen my walk of love by my endurance. Andrew, come to the piano this morning with one minute to spare. How many give me five minutes? You see, 5, 10, 15, 20. We got it. That joke still works. <laughs> Why are we talking about this? And this is the word the Lord gave me. You can, if there's one thing on the screen you want to take a picture of, it's this this morning. Why are we talking about this? Some miracles this year will come not by a supernatural event that happens to me, but by way of a miracle that God grows through me. We have a perception of what miracles look like. But God said, not all the miracles I'm doing this year is going to be some grand spectacular event that happens to you. Some of the miracles I'm wanting to do, I'm going to want to grow through you. And growing is not always the funnest thing. Have you ever wondered why the Lord didn't set this up in a way that I get born again and the next day I am perfect and entire and wanting nothing? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Why isn't it like that? The only way that would work is if the day after you were born again, God took you to heaven. Boom. <laughs> Why isn't it set up like that? That would make life so easy. And unfortunately, we give people sometimes the idea that becoming a Christian just makes everything like peaches and cream. The reason it's not like that is all living things must grow. Every living thing. Every living thing must have the opportunity to grow. You want to blow your mind this morning? Even Jesus, the Bible said in Luke 2.52, said that he had to grow. In wisdom, Jesus, why did he have to grow in wisdom? He had to grow in favor with God and man. All living things have to grow. That includes me, and that includes you. Let me ask you, if you were starving, didn't have a bite to eat, and you were crying out to God, and said, God, I don't know what I'm going to do. If I, don't, if I don't find a meal today, I need a miracle. I believe we ought to cry out to God in those moments, right? And somebody brought a basket of fruit and left it at your front door. Would that be a miracle? Wouldn't that be amazing? You'd be praising God running all around your house. But you know what else? A mature fruit tree in your backyard can produce miracle after miracle after miracle, year after year after year, where you're not dependent on God to step in with some miracle just to feed you for that day. You have enough to be a blessing to somebody else and somebody else. And this is why it's important. God doesn't want just to keep coming through for us. He wants to mature us so things are growing through us. 
so we can be a living miracle. Let's stand to our feet this morning. Oh, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. And you might think, <clears throat> you know, Pastor Ryan, just tell me all the things I want to hear. <laughs> but God keeps pushing us in this direction of maturity. Miracles. It's a year of miracles. I think it's also a year of maturity. Because a miracle, imagine that fruit growing on that tree. When it gets ripe and ready. That's what God's wanting to do through each and every one of us. How we live, what we believe, how we live, what my purpose is. And God's pinpointing some things. Take a look at really how your faith walk is. It's important. Take a look for real how your patience is. Take a look for real how your love walk is. It'll show by your endurance. Take a look for real. Because the real matters. And this church is not called to offer a bowl of fake fruit on Sunday mornings. When we cross the threshold of that church, we're going to that church building and we see an influx of people. What will they find? Will they find a mixed bag of fruit? some real and some fake or they will find a group of people who know how to pray, know how to believe, know how to stand know how to encourage, know how to really love, know how to really fight with you, to pray with you not fight with you, fight for you, pray with you, right? Talk about some real fruit because alive things grow Hallelujah